Pico Kogan, and I'm a member of City Club's Board of Directors, and I work at the, as the Director of Community Affairs at, for Children's Institute. For more than 100 years, City Club of Portland is where civic-minded people have come together to find solutions to our region's biggest challenges. Today, we're a diverse network of people who are eager to learn, connect, and share ideas for a better Oregon. Thank you for joining us at the EcoTrust Building in Northwest Portland where thousands of people are joining us online, on the radio, and on TV. Live viewers are watching on KGW's website, Facebook feed, and news app. Our radio audience is listening via X-Ray FM stations, 107.1 and 91.1 FM. And TV viewers will watch today's programming on community media television. We are incredibly grateful for the support of our media partners in bringing City Club forums to our community. In addition to City Club's valued media partnerships, our sponsors, volunteers, and staff enable us to put on Oregon's best civic programs week after week. A special thank you goes to EcoTrust for working with us to bring Fighting Forum to this space. Thank you also to sister businesses, Yahala and World Foods for providing wonderful food. Please join me in showing our appreciation to everyone who has made this event possible. Before our speakers begin, let me provide a brief overview of the Student Success Act. The Student Success Act marks a turning point for education in Oregon. Passed by the legislature in May, when fully implemented, it will provide $1 billion a year in new funding for education from early learning to 12th grade. The purpose of the Student Success Act is to improve education outcomes and reduce academic disparities for students who come from historically underserved communities students of color, students with disabilities, students navigating poverty, homelessness, and foster care, dual language learners, and other student groups that have historically experienced academic disparities. The bill also prioritizes meeting students' mental or behavioral health needs, providing equitable access to academic courses, establishing and strengthening partnerships, and providing teachers and staff together, and the development of strategies to ensure that students who are at risk and experience barriers to opportunity stay on track to graduate. By expanding early learning, early education, and connecting early learning to K-12 for the first time, this comprehensive approach to er education recognizes that learning begins at birth. It does not begin when a child enters the kindergarten classroom for the first time. The Student Success Act opens a door to educational transformation in Oregon. Joining us today to talk about the Student Success Act are Miriam Calderon, Parasa Chanrami and Mark Witte. Will you please all join the stage and then I will introduce you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Miriam Calderon is the Early Learning System Director overseeing the Early Learning Division for the State of Oregon. Before coming to Oregon, she served as a Senior Director of Learning at the Bynum Family Foundation, where she shaped a new $10 million investment in a birth to three system for the District of Columbia. Parasa Chanrami is a Policy and Implementation Director at Stanford Children in Oregon. In her role, she manages the Oregon Affiliates legislative work. She has nearly a decade of experience in education policy in Oregon, Washington, and Minnesota. Before working in education policy, she was a kindergarten teacher in North Minneapolis. And Mark Witte. Mark has served in education for the last 34 years as a teacher, coach, guidance counselor, athletic director, principal, and superintendent. He is in his fifth year serving as a superintendent of Baker School District, which supports 1,700 brick and mortar students, along with 2,500 students statewide, through Baker Webb Academy and Baker Early College. Please join me in welcoming our first speaker and the rest of the group. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danielle, and to the City Club for including me in this really important conversation about the Student Success Act. I also want to say thank you for the very low podium. I feel very tall right now. Um, I am so excited to be here and to be joined by um, two panelists who have not 
who have played a very critical role in um, Student Success Act and K-12 education in our state, but who also are wonderful champions of early um, learning. So my job here today is to really talk about um, the early learning investments, which make up about 20% of the investments in the Student Success Act. Um, and I'm going to say a lot of things and probably overwhelm you, overwhelm you with a lot of information and try to avoid jargon. But if you take away anything from what I'm about to um, talk to you about today, I hope it's this. The significance of this moment for Oregon for early learning is that um, public education now, through this law, as Danielle said, recognizes that children are born learning. Learning does not begin in kindergarten or even the first day of preschool. It starts at birth, and early learning is critical for student success. So raise your hand if you have a child in your life who, in preschool or childcare. Okay. okay, now keep it raised if you thought it was too expensive or hard to access. <laughs> You are like tens of thousands of families across our state who dropped their child off for the first day of childcare or preschool last week. Yet almost the same number of children and families didn't get that opportunity. This is because the greatest predictors of whether or not children get an early learning experience are race, zip code, and income. This investment starts to change that, and it begins to seed a more equitable early care and education sector for Oregon. So um, how does the stu what is happening with the Student Success Act and what really is the opportunity for, for young um, early learners? Uh, first, it's the early learning account established under this legislation is going to add 200 million annually to state's early learning investments. This is nearly doubling the current state investment. So it's significant. Within the account, the legislature allocated resources that were comprehensive. So it's creating more than 10,000 new early learning slots for infants, toddlers, um, and preschoolers. It's important to recognize the comprehensive nature of the programs that are supported um, through, these, through this new account because we know that a range of families have a range of needs and it's not just one single program um, that can respond to that. So the investment is comprehensive. The other thing that I want you to know is that the investment is targeted. So we, these um, programs and investments will reach children in low-income families, children in, and families in poverty, and children who face developmental risk. The other thing that's important to note is that it's going to allow us to scale proven programs. right? So currently, um, many of the programs that we invest in at the state level are proven to be effective, but we, don't, we fall very short of reaching the eligible um, families um, for these programs. So this, ex ex this investment is helping us scale. Just to give you some perspective on that, I want to um, share that in uh, Oregon ranks right now 32nd um, amongst all um, states in access to high quality preschool for four-year-olds. Um, through this investment um, in Oregon pre-kindergarten and preschool promise, two of our state preschool programs, Oregon will now be ranked, um, will increase into the mid-20s. Sort of my back of the envelope estimate there. So you can see um, a, a significant jump for our state. I think another example is in Early Head Start. Um, Early Head Start is a federal program for infants and toddlers um, and their families in poverty. So to qualify for Early Head Start, a family of four would typically need to earn $25,000 a year um, or less. As a state, for again, for a better part of a decade, we've been investing. Um, to uh, help more families access this program. With this new investment, we'll be able to serve an additional 1,200 more families in Early Head Start um, beginning next year. The investment is also impacting early intervention and early childhood special education, which is administered by my colleagues of the Department of Education. Um, this is a program for children who have identified qualifying developmental delays or disabilities. Um, with this new investment, children will be able to receive the adequate level of services as defined under federal law. And it creates two new investments, one in parenting education, which will support families as their role and parents as their, in their role as their child's first teacher. Teacher. This will be done through a public-private partnership in expanding the services provided through parenting hubs all across Oregon. And then last but not least, the early learning account includes a new $10 million annual investment in a newly established equity fund, which is going to build the capacity of culturally specific organizations to serve more children and families of color.
color and Native American children across our state. Currently, many of these community-based organizations offer programming to families with young children, but they are not at scale and they're not growing because we have very few dedicated public funds um, to support their efforts. And the Act make crit makes critical investments in early childhood educators. As I visit communities across our state, I always ask, what's the biggest challenge you face in getting more families access to quality early care and education and early learning? And the answer is usually always the same, finding qualified staff that are willing to do this work. This act makes investments in a workforce that is almost entirely comprised of women, low-income women, and women of color. And it is gonna help raise their salaries, and it is gonna deliver more support so that they can implement the best practices that we know are essential in early care and education. I think some of you know in this room that despite the very important role that caregivers and early childhood educators play in children and families' lives, they make nearly minimum wage, they often need to use public benefits despite working full-time, and we have underinvested in the supports to help them advance in their own professional learning. And I'm excited that the Student Success Act recognizes that wrong and is beginning to change that. Um, uh, um, how is the early learning investments addressing equity? The Student Success Act is a major step forward in ensuring that children who have been historically underserved in these programs have access. Some of what we know about early care and education in our state and nationally is that families really foot the bill. So 70% of the investments um, in early care and education in our state are from parents. Because we rely on the private market to fund this, it, what is really a public good, communities of color and rural communities are the hardest hit in even having a supply of early learning in their communities. It also means that those who cannot afford it simply go without it. So when you look at the data on families that in the highest income quintile and whether they participate in early, early learning, it's nearly um, universal, right? And when there isn't a public supply of, of, of early care and education, families in the lower income quintiles um, don't get that opportunity. What we know is that this exacerbates existing inequities and solidifies opportunity gaps before children even enter the elementary school door, right? So I say as much as and often as I can that early child to high quality, affordable, accessible early childhood education is essential to lifting more of uh, more families in opportunity into opportunity in our state. Um, we also want all of our Oregonians to be ready for their future and the traits that make them successful, getting along with peers, critical thinking, they start in the earliest years. And our own data tell us this, that when children enter kindergarten already behind, they very rarely or experience a lot of difficulty in catching up by third grade. Research also tells us that the cognitive gaps between low-income children and their more affluent peers begin as early as nine months of age. So we have to start investing in children and families at birth. So the third point I want to make is what's happening right now with implementation. So the next several months are going to be critical for us at the state um, who have this wonderful privilege of helping um, guide implementation of this act to hear from communities and families and all those who are interested in these investments, particularly diverse voices and perspectives. Communities will really truly help determine how we distribute these funds for the entirety of the act. So in the coming weeks, I know with the Early Learning Division, we will be releasing a toolkit and really partnering with our early, our six 16 early learning hubs across the state to support them and being able to convene their partners and their communities to create a local, to put together a local vision and a plan for the early care and education um, services in, in these investments. I want to, I would be remiss in not pointing out that in this community there has already been an extens extensive effort around this planning. The Preschool for All Task Force led by Commissioner Jessica Vager peterson and Early Learning Multnomah. They've engaged with over 100 different community members um, in putting a plan together. And I think what's remarkable about this effort is that it goes beyond an assessment of family and community needs, right? This process has looked at the assets that are present um, in this community to be able to expand early learning and has also engaged the community in effort to define what these experiences 
should look like for children and families. So I want to uh, conclude with thinking about how you can stay and get involved. And first I want to share that we have an early learning council in the state that has set a bold vision for equity in early childhood through a strategic plan for our early learning system. That plan is called Raise Up Oregon. So in addition to early care and education, this plan puts forward the vision for how housing, the health system, the human services sector, and K-12 can all play a role in supporting um, more families to be healthy and stable and for young children to thrive and enter kindergarten ready to succeed. So today I've talked a lot about the investments in the early learning investments in the Student Success Act, but this session that we just finished in or in Salem was really historic for young children and families in many ways. We had legislation to support paid family leave. Um, we have legislation that passed that is creating a universally accessible, available home visiting program for families um, with newborns. The state has invested in um, the earned income tax credit, including providing a higher credit to families with infants. And I could really go on and on and on. And a number of these new um, policy um, and investments are aligned with Raise Up Oregon. So connecting with your hub in your community, Early Learning Multnomah, is a great way to understand more about about what's happening and where we need communities to be engaged as well as staying connected to them through the preschool for all initiative so my final sort of request to all of you is to continue to lift up this important issue we need you so while the student success act has made incredible investments in early care and education this work is far from done we know that more families need these services than what we will be able to achieve through implementing this act two-thirds of families in Oregon have have all of their parents, of young children, have all of their parents working. Last week I visited Albina Head Start in Northeast Portland with the governor and learned 300 families are on the waiting list for early Head Start just in that community. Thousands of families across Oregon are searching for affordable quality child care. We know that the lack of quality early care and education hurts everyone. It hurts businesses, it hurts taxpayers, it hurts families, and it hurts children. And we know it's not just a problem in Oregon, it's a problem nationally, and it's gonna take all of us working together to solve this. So um, I have some handouts and more information about Raise Up Oregon. Um, the Oregon Department of Education has a website about the Student Success Act where you can and stay update, updated and receive um, a lot more information um, as we move forward in this really important moment for young children and families and for public education in Oregon. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon everyone. My name is Parasa Chanrami. I'm the Policy and Implementation Director at Stanford Children out here in Oregon. It's an honor to be here, and as you heard from Danielle and Miriam, from heard from what they've shared, so much hard work and effort went into the Student Success Act, and it creates a monumental and historic education package that has a steady revenue stream and targeted funding towards systems, programs, and strategies that support the growth and the development of our schools and our students. The Student Success Act has been called a once-in-a-generation type of investment. It, because it adds $2 billion over the next biennium of targeted funding on top of the state school fund. And that positions Oregon even closer to the quality education funding model. Our executive director, Toya Fick, and myself have had the unique opportunity this, this past session to work on the student investment account. And we worked very closely with the education associations, community partners, the governor's office, and Oregon lawmakers um, from the Joint Committee for Student Success. In developing the student investment account, we reviewed and incorporated findings from the Joint Committee for Student Success, says Roadshow, where they learned and saw firsthand how our educators are expected to do more with less. They heard about the need for more stable and adequate funding, and how, if there is more funding, how Oregonians would want to target those dollars. And they also saw how Measure 98 provides a targeted funding model that really resonates with Oregon's, Oregonians from all corners of the state. And our organization, who championed Measure 98, now we were tasked 
with being able to take lessons learned from implementation of Measure 98 and figure out how to incorporate this into the student investment account. So some examples I wanted to share were the policies that prioritize and focus on students from historically underrepresented communities. And um, so some of those specific policies focus on equitable course assignment as well as um, course scheduling for English learners to ensure that students are taking the right amount of courses, the right amount of courses, and to make sure that they're graduating on time. And uh, the other example I wanted to share was that Measure 98 really balanced clear goals and targeted funding with meaningful flexibility. And we also worked on reflecting on what we can learn from the old student, in, um, the old school improvement fund, and combine the strongest elements to create a model that you see in today's student investment accounts. Thanks to this collective effort in partnership with community organizations, various associations, leadership from the governor's office, and a willingness to be bold among Oregon lawmakers, we now have a student investment account that will help school districts meet students' behavioral and mental health needs and increase academic achievement for students and reduce academic disparities for students navigating poverty, students of color, students with disabilities, those who are emerging bilingual, and those who are in foster care or homeless, and any other student group that has historically experienced disparities. The student investment account also outlines how districts may spend these new dollars to help achieve those goals. And I was trying to figure out a good way to remember all of the allowable uses of funds, and um, the kindergarten teacher and me came up with a mnemonic device pear, just like the fruit. <laughs> so there are four major buckets, and I want you to just remember pear. P is for provide a well-rounded education. So what falls under that bucket is early literacy, middle school programs and supports, and as well as broadening curricular opportunities, and that includes arts, music, PE, STEM, career technical education, engaging electives, <laughs> college credit opportunities, dropout prevention um, strategies, life skills classes, TAG, as well as support for more school librarians. E stands for expand instructional learning time. So districts can use those dollars for adding more hours or days, more summer programming, before and after school programming, and then A is for address student health and safety. Um, under that bucket, we have uh, everything from social emotional learning to trauma-informed practices, mental and behavioral health, more school health professionals and facility improvements. And last but not least, R stands for reduce class sizes and caseloads. Um, now many of you may be wondering, how, how is the funding structure and how do we get that? Um, so districts receive funding based on the number of kids served and the types of students served. So using Oregon's weighted funding formula, districts will receive a base amount of funding based on the number of students and then additional funding for students who are navigating poverty, who are emerging bilingual, and uh, students who have a disability. And the other piece that I would add is um, for the student investment account, we also increased the weighting of the poverty weight. So it went from 25% to 50%. And then we also added floors for small rural remote schools. Since we're here in Portland today, I'll share more about that. Um, Portland Public Schools is estimated to receive over 39 million during the 2020 20 one school year and that's just for one year that doubles over the next two year period and so those are additional dollars for all the things that I just talked about well-rounded education more instructional time more supports around student health and safety as well as more work to be done around class sizes and caseloads now how do districts get this funding in 2020 well they have to do two important things one they have to complete a needs assessment and then the earliest they can turn in that needs assessment is november 1st they all must be done by december 6th of this year the needs assessment must address how a district is um, doing when it comes to reducing academic dis disparities, meeting students' mental health and behavioral needs, providing equitable access to academic courses, 
allowing teachers and staff enough time to collaborate and reflect and work together to support students. And last is creating strong partnerships for student achievement. The other thing is if a district finds that they have a lot of areas of improvement in all of those core elements of the needs assessment, they can use the student investment account dollars to cover and provide support to really build up those foundational pieces. And after the needs assessment, they'll need to submit a plan detailing their growth goals for addressing disparities and raising achievement and how they'll utilize the new dollars to reach those goals. Just remember PAIR. Provide a well-rounded education, expand instructional time, address student health and safety, and reduce class sizes and caseloads. Plans will be due in the spring of 2020, and once they are approved, new dollars will be flowing in by the summer of 2020. Something that we and the associations and other partners are particularly proud of is the fact that the law requires districts to engage school employees and families and students from historically underrepresented and underserved communities as they develop both their needs assessments and their plans. This was really important to us because we see that all of our futures are inextricably linked and how imperative it is for districts to develop and sustain meaningful partnerships with school employees, families, and students, and the broader community. These partnerships will help ensure that these new dollars truly do improve outcomes and address disparities, that they create new opportunities more equitably, and provide Oregon students with a strong public education system that sets them up for success. It's worth noting that community engagement isn't a one-time deal. This should be an ongoing, active process. And it's gonna require districts to do a lot of deep work around examining communities who have been engaged and which ones haven't, removing barriers both real and perceived when it comes to supporting historically underserved and underrepresented communities, and challenging systems, practices, and mindsets by embedding equity throughout the work. And that's where we all come in. This is an all hands on deck moment, and I'm gonna do a similar call to action like Miriam did in her presentation. We finally have the education funding, but we need to work together to make the most of it for our students. So here's my charge to all of you. Get involved. Connect with local community partners and associations to learn more about the Student Success Act. Reach out. Your local district and schools can use your help in supporting sustained community engagement, especially from parents and students and community lit leaders from underrepresented and underserved communities. Think about the resources you can offer and share, give and leverage that to support equity and community engagement. Show up. There will be community convenings and school board meetings in districts all over the state where folks will need to work together on these needs assessments and plans. And that'll be a really unique opportunity to really shape how your district decides to spend these new dollars. And last but not least, we need you to be the leader our students need you to be. The Student Success Act removes all excuses. Oregon can no longer say it's letting students down because of a funding problem. Because with this new investment, we're even closer to the quality education funding model. But money alone isn't a solution. And we've all heard the phrase, it takes a village to raise a child. Let's be that village. Let's work together to change the odds for students in our state and be the leaders our students need us to be. Thank you. Actually, this is the tallest I've felt in a long time, so <laughs> I must say. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to uh, come before you and share uh, the story of Baker, Baker County and our school district in Baker City. Um, this, I'm going to start and finish with, at the end of the day, this is an economic investment that is critical for the success of our next generation uh, in Oregon. It's an economic investment. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of background uh, of Baker City. I assume many of you have uh, driven at least through 
uh, Baker City on I-84. I don't know if you've ever uh, pulled off and actually spent, uh, spent some time. It's a wonderful city to be in. Uh, there are 10,000 residents in Baker City and there's 4,000 in our outlying communities and on farms and ranches within our uh, community. If uh, some of you, as uh, may be a little known fact, um, assuming that Paul Harvey's uh, researchers are actually correct, um, Baker in the 1950s had more millionaires per capita than any other county in the United States. That is no longer true. <laughs> so at the turn of the century, and to prove it, if you ever pull off, you'll see three clock towers in Baker City. 10,000 population, three clock towers, all built in the early 1900s. A uh, very wealthy community, quite frankly. It was based on natural resources, mining, agriculture. Those were the things that it was based on. In the last 30 years, rural Baker County, rural Oregon, and rural United States has definitely suffered from a lack of middle class earning jobs. The blue collar jobs have left and we're uh, managing with a lot uh, lower uh, you know, social economic jobs that can manage. How does that impact the school district? Well, in Baker School District at the uh, end of the 1990s, we had 2,500 students. Today, like many rural schools in Oregon, we have 1,700, we've declined 800. What does that mean in real terms? $6.4 million per year lost revenue to support our children in Baker County. That's what it means. Economy of scale counts. Uh, when you have a lower economy of scale, you cannot offer as many programming to the, as much programming to the children under your care. Our families, like many Oregonians, are not on track to achieve the American dream. Raj Chetty, preeminent economist from Harvard, has said, and I'm sure you know this, quote, you're more likely to achieve the American dream in Canada than the United States of America. That's true in Baker County. That's true in Oregon. That's true in Portland. Okay, Jared Diamond, I uh, love reading his books. He's got some great ones. The latest one that he uh, wrote is Upheaval. Highly recommend that you open it up and read through it. Um, with regards to economic mobility, quote, sadly, the problem is making itself worse. Economic inequality has been increasing and social economic mobility has been decreasing in the United States, essentially for the last four decades. That's a challenging point. That's a challenging point for our families, and I want to be clear, in my mind, that's a challenging point for a democracy. It's critical that our families, our children, the next generation, can move and be able to upwardly mobile achieve um, as their parents and their grandparents certainly did. I was really pleased in April of 2018 when the Student Success Committee, led by Senator Roblin and Representative uh, Barbara Warner-Smith and their team came to Baker City and listened. And they did. They listened. They listened to our students. They spent two hours with our students going through and really doing a deep dive into how they feel about their schools. They listened to our community, they listened to our partners, and they listened um, to our parents. This is what they heard, crumbling infrastructure. This is a common theme, especially in areas that do not have a strong tax base. Most rural America does not. Um, severe, and I can attest to this, I've been at this for 34 years, severe mental health issues. I have students in my district that come to us in kindergarten with mental health issues that require substantially more support to be able to become successful. Need for schools to be safe for their students, for their staff, and for the community. Other things that were heard, need programming outside of the core subject areas. Reading, writing, and arithmetic are great, but it's the things that you did outside of those areas that you remember as a child that actually impacted who you are today. Obviously, you need to have the skill sets. But if they didn't have the arts, if you didn't have your sports, if you didn't have those other opportunities, 
you would be a different person today. And quite frankly, that is a major point of the opportunity gap that I find in our district and I find wherever I go in the state of Oregon. Not all families have the ability to provide those kind of experiences. We need to fill the gap if we want all children in Oregon to be able to achieve the American dream. Okay, affordable daycare is a major, major thing. And uh, you know, I didn't raise my hand that I have a, a grandchild at this point in daycare. Um, I could uh, in the near future, I assume. But uh, affordable daycare is an absolute barrier, barrier. In Baker City, it has been identified as the number one reason uh, that families or, or uh, spouses can't go to work. It's a challenge point, it's a barrier to get into the labor market affordable daycare, affordable childcare, quality preschool. Okay, the SSA uh, Student uh, Achievement Act uh, gives us the best opportunity to invest in the future of Oregon. In Baker School District, we have, with phenomenal partners, community partners, have been able to develop a number of programs only by being very aggressive on getting grants. And I must say, I, I'm very grateful to Umqua Bank, OCF, the Ford Family Foundation, and locally, the Leo Adler. Those organizations have helped us close the gap that we weren't doing as a society and as a community. I'm very grateful for that. Because of that, we've been able to, over the last six years, develop Summer Academy K through six, uh, for six weeks that's targeted uh, programming for students. So they can, quite frankly, it's a fun place. It's the only school I've ever been to. At the end of the day, they're crying, not because they're excited about going home, because it's gonna be over. It's fantastic work with the community partners. Friday Academy, many rural schools in Oregon el elsewhere are four day, we are. I wanted to be able to make sure that we had targeted programming for Fridays, on Fridays where you could get breakfast and lunch and get additional supports, and we do. Friday Plus, uh, I could spend two days uh, explaining that one to you, but it's K-12 uh, program that we provide opportunities that are out of the norm. I am, again, an advocate of opportunities. It's exposure to things that define who you are and develop your confidence and where you want to be as a person as you grow older. Jumpstart, zero robotics. I got to put in a plug. We did win at OSU uh, this summer with our zero robotics, so I got to put in a plug for that. And, and I got to see uh, on the International Space Station, um, we got to see our program that our kids developed uh, operate the robotic arm up there. So that's pretty fun. Uh, steam camps for grades uh, four through six in the Sunder. Kinder camp, six weeks. We target students and we work with them six weeks prior to school to make sure we can close that gap. Kinder boost, first year we've done it. We've taken kids uh, uh, that haven't had preschool and we give them two weeks prior to go ahead and ramp up. Uh, it helps them understand and not be as fearful as coming into school and what it's going to be like. Summer algebra readiness and, and a plethora more. These programs can move forward because of the SSA program. Without that, I would continually have to try to find grants, and anybody that's written grants knows sustainability is the key. And so I'm relieved that the SSA got passed because uh, we can absolutely hold on to those programmings and expand. Okay, for the last 18 months, uh, I've been part of a collaborative in Baker City. We, it's not particularly a creative name, but Baker Early Learning Collaborative. Uh, we have 18 partners that have been trying to figure out how can we do a better job? What's our vision for birth to five in Baker County? We have partners from Head Start, Early Intervention, uh, from uh, library, from arts, all across the board working with us. How can we provide quality, uh, birth to five education. In that vision, we need highly qualified staff. We need to pay that staff at an appropriate level. That is the only way we're going to be able to sustain and keep those programs in, mo in, in uh, motion. It's just a fascination to me that uh, over the years that we've paid so little for our child care, when at the end of the day, that is actually the biggest resource that you have as a grandparent or as a parent. That's the biggest resource we have, and it is our future. Uh, we have a vision of high quality preschool. We have a vision of relief nursery. We have a vision of childcare, not only for my staff's children, but those children within the community. It needs to be affordable. It needs to be mixed delivery. We need to have all families involved in this uh, early learning center that we hope to create. 
SSA is an investment that, that has created a pathway, in my opinion, where Oregonians can reach the American dream. Education is the most critical factor. I've been a high school principal for 15 years of my career. I can tell you that when a ninth grader shows up on my doorsteps and they are disengaged from their education, they do not believe they can be successful. They do not believe they belong in the halls of my school. I can tell you it's very difficult to go ahead and raise that child to the point of self-worth that they can go ahead and get a graduation and move on to the American dream. In my opinion, in 10 years as a superintendent, the best return on investment is actually birth to five. You got to start early and you got to start soon if you're going to get that job done. If you wait until they come to me as a high school principal, you're going to be challenged. I'm going to be challenged. I'm grateful for the leadership in the state, uh, Children's Institute, uh, Miriam, and the work that the uh, Oregon um, Early Learning Division has done, Stanford Children, and the work that they've done. Uh, Measure 98 has been a godsend. It's really reinvented high level, hands on work that students can do that's highly engaging. It's been really critical for our students, especially at the secondary level. Thank you. Uh, I do believe that as educators, we have to make a, a, a promise to the community, a promise to the business community, that we will stand firm and make sure that we use this investment to the best of our ability so that all children in Oregon can reach the American dream. Thank you. For our radio audience, this is City Club of Portland's Friday Forum, coming to you from the Ecotrust Building in Northwest Portland. I'm Colin Jones, past president of City Club. With us today are Miriam Calderon with the State of Oregon Early Learning Division, Prasa Chanrame with Stand for Children in Oregon, and Mark Witte, the superintendent of the Baker School District. We're going to open the floor to questions now. Everyone watching or listening today is welcome to ask a question. If you've written a question on an index card, Hold it high for City Club staff to collect. You may also submit questions via Twitter using the hashtag Friday Forum. To those who would like to ask a question at the mic, please identify yourself and ask one question in 30 seconds or less. One good way to do that is to ensure that your first sentence ends in a question mark and that there is no second sentence. <laughs> so. I actually can't see where the microphone is. So we're over there. Um, to get us started while folks are making their way to the microphone and writing questions down, I was wondering if one of you could talk a little bit about sort of the, the statewide bucket of funding. So Measure 98 implementation, universal meals, um, suicide and dropout prevention programs, and those. Great, I'll take that question. This is Parasa from Stanford Children. So the third statewide bucket represents 30% of the fund. It includes full funding for Measure 98. It includes investments in free and reduced lunch, uh, more nutritional programs. Um, there's some work happening around suicide prevention and student uh, safety and school safety. The other piece I would add is that this third bucket also makes really important investments in um, some of the statewide equity initiatives. So one of the new equity initiatives is the Latinx Student Success Plan. And then um, it also provides continued funding for the African American Black Student Success Plan. Um, what makes um, this bucket slightly different is that um, school districts will need to work with their local community partners to submit a plan to request this funding. And so um, they'll need to submit a plan based on the goals of all of the different particular initiatives that they want to focus on and um, that's how they'll be able to qualify for the additional funding on top of what they're getting through the student investment account and all the collaboration that's happening with early learning hubs through the early learning account wonderful thank you and let's take the first question from the microphone Uh, for your 
Yeah, so we've, uh, through the uh, state and ODE, there's a process uh, that essentially is about accountability. And so in that process, uh, as you uh, mentioned, all those different groups are going to be, uh, have to be part of that plan to develop. You know, at, at the end of the day, we need a plan that fits each school district. And the only way you're going to know what each school district needs is to listen. So we've got to listen and really try to understand what are the best uh, avenues to invest this money. The challenge for most of us, and I'm looking at a few superintendents, the challenge for most of us is that there are people that will come to the mic, come to the meeting, and have their voice heard readily. They don't necessarily represent the majority of the people that you serve. It's just challenging, and we've got to work very diligently in Baker to make sure for us uh, managing or, or to engaging those on the lower socioeconomic scale. That's who we not got to work hard on. And that's a challenge. I, I'm seeing other superintendents around the building saying the exact same thing. But that is the, the challenge. That's what we need to do. Thank you. And that was excellent question modeling. Thank you. <laughs> Let's take the next question from the microphone. Hello. I'm Renee Mitchell, um, co-founder of I Am More which is a nationally award-winning social-emotional learning initiative. I'm wondering, um, because we are at the, 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 the um, crux of trauma-informed practices, social-emotional learning, and, and also equity, is there room in the uh, Student Support Act for new programming that is also transformational? I, I certainly believe there is, and, and maybe Miriam and uh, Parissa can add, but I think there is. One of the, the areas that I anticipate or, or can imagine is more planned and intense, um, more ways to go ahead and engage people that we currently are engaged with. And I think uh, for us, we've actually invested in one parent um, contact person that really tries to work with all the families and to help remove barriers for them. I think that might be another area where we'd like to uh, expand. It's challenging. You have families that have gone through a school system and potentially didn't have a good experience. We need them. We need to understand them. We need to be able to assist them on raising their children. And so we've got to do a better job of reaching out to that group. We'll take the next question. Yeah, oh, please add to yeah. that. Yeah. Absolutely, and something else I'd want to add is that um, one of the things we're encouraging districts to do is work really closely with community-based partners who are doing incredible, tr and like you said, transformational programming for students of color, for students who are emerging bilingual, and that's something we want to reinforce throughout the process because the, the district may not be the expert. And it's the community that's the expert. And so I think that the more advocacy uh, that we do, the more pushing that we do, that will help make that partnership um, and support for each other more possible. And so I'd love to connect with you more to chat uh, about what we can do more in Portland on that. Excellent. Thank you. I want you to take one question from the card. Um, you've all talked about the importance of closing barriers or closing gaps and addressing barriers for students of color, students with disabilities, low-income students, uh, English language learners. What checks and oversight are there for districts and schools, right? These are block grants that are formula-driven. If a district makes no progress on this front and only improves outcomes for white students or wealthy students, what kind of accountability is in place? Okay, I'll go ahead and take that question first. So um, in terms of accountability measures, there's actually a lot built in throughout the student investment account. So one of the first things is doing work around the needs assessment. So what does uh, the data about our students tell us about who's accessing opportunities and who isn't accessing opportunities? And how do we use that as a starting point to reflect on how we're doing as a district and as a broader community, and then discussing with 
with our partners, um, other educators, neighboring districts and schools, and the Department of Ed, as well as other resources, local early learning hubs as well, talking about the transition from early learning to K-12. Um, all of those are going to be critical conversations for us to do this work together. And then the other thing I would add is, um, in addition to districts putting this work together, they also need to be able to present this information before the school board, and it will have to be approved by the school board. So that's one layer of accountability where school board members will play an important role with strategic planning, with follow-up, with assessing whether or not the plan is reflective of the equity work that you're um, focused on doing at your district. And then the other piece is that the department has a critical role in helping review the plans, monitoring progress, um, looking at how the district is spending the dollars, and getting a sense of how we're moving the needle for kids. The law is very clear that we should be focused on reducing academic disparities for students of color, our emerging bilingual students, our foster students, students with disabilities, homeless students. It's very specific in that way. And I think that's an opportunity for us at the local level to really leverage the law for this local work that we're gonna need to do. Cause it's gonna take hard work. It's gonna take a lot of pushing and the department is a layer of accountability, but we as community members will all need to take part in this process. Process. I can speak to this um, from the early learning perspective. Um, I think similarly, uh, we, you know, there's no universal right to any service before kindergarten um, and in this country or in Oregon. So when we think about these investments and, and how, to, how to invest in, in the you know, public investments in this space, we start thinking from a perspective of how do you prioritize within um, an eligible population? So for us, that's sort of the first step, I think, in thinking about the equity lens. So when I referenced um, the work that our hubs will be doing and communities engagement in this process, we, we know one of the first critical steps is how do you identify priorities within a universe of children and families that you know need and could benefit for this service, but you won't reach with the resources that you have. So that means you've got to set priorities within priorities. That's number one. At the early learning division, again, part of some of the oversight role that we do to play is to then the children and families that are identified and priorities in those communities actually receive the services. So access is one piece. I think the other piece um, when we think about equity in the early learning space is then how children are served and what that experience looks like. So there's not... Um, Sometimes I hear early learning is so complicated, it feels like there's this range of programs. But you know what you want for your six-month-old is different than what you want for your 18-month-old and what you want for your four-year-old, right? Um, and that's important. And so again, um, the work that hearing from communities about what do you know, how can these dollars be best leveraged? What are the assets? How can we most responsive to what families and children? that are going to support them to be thriving and their children to be ready for kindergarten is really important. And again, through that, we have different levers with the with it, the state to say, how do we support then communities and being able to implement and deliver those services, right? And how do we have that, that kind of um, proper oversight as well to make sure for us standards play a very big role so we have learning expectations for children which do they know and be able to do by the time they get to kindergarten so the question about social emotional development is really important that is a, a foundation of what we would say is essential for children to be ready is to develop their social emotional development so we're looking for programs that are going to address the range of expectations for what children should know and to be able to do and then we also have standards that say what should these experiences look like, right? Um, how do programs partner with families? What kinds of experiences are available for children? Um, how does that align to community needs? So that's the sort of interplay and the inter process we do within states and communities around these investments. I'm just going to make one small point that there is a, a place locally where you can plug in as a citizen. That's your local school board. Uh, having high quality individuals that really care about the future is a great place uh, to serve. So I'd really encourage you that. I've been blessed to, to work with school boards that certainly have the best interests of students in mind and recognizing the importance of all children. But I just strongly encourage anybody that's out there or listening, boy, get involved and uh, get involved with your school board. If you can't do that, be, uh, get involved with your parent groups. Uh, certainly there's places where you can advocate and assist school districts in doing the best job possible. Absolutely. Let's take another question from the microphone. 
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Michael McCrary Dennis, and I am the CEO and founder of Mentorship, and we are connecting mentors and students and communities for scholarships. We've built a mobile platform to do just that. And my question to you guys was, I didn't hear anything about scholarships being mentioned, and how do you see that in the plan for motivating our students to achieve through their academic uh, matriculation such that they have the opportunities uh, to go to college knowing that they're going to graduate debt-free versus succumbing to debt and lifelong other issues? Boy, I want to hook up with you uh, and talk further because that's, that's a fantastic question and really something that we need to address as school districts in Baker City. We have utilized uh, some of our major 98 monies uh, to go ahead and get more help, more assistance, grad assist, coach. We also have a futures program, uh, which we've uh, just created that and really assist students, uh, really uh, sixth grade on up, but uh, make plans and figure out where they can get scholarships and really dive in there and assist. One of the challenges that I've seen and that I'm challenging my secondary <coughs> uh, team with, uh, I've seen in my career a number of times where a school district, and there's schools that have done a better job than where I've been at times, but have gotten kids uh, in poverty or in an equity situation where they're not uh, on an even playing field, they get them to graduation. And then they go off and boom. Where's the network? Where's the mentorship? And so I've challenged my team at the secondary level in, in that we need to develop uh, relationships with business, with um, Lions Club or Rotarian Clubs, with the AAUW, with different groups to, to plug in with these kids so they have a coach that can assist them when they come to struggles. My daughter was a BYU Provo. She's there two days and she calls me up and she says, Dad, this is really scary. I don't think I'm going to be able to make it. I've got some challenges here. I don't know what to do. And so I know as a parent, just listen, just listen, just listen, and encourage. There's too many families that that is not, they don't have the network to fall back on to be able to get those kind of assist points to be able to move forward. That's where I think your notion is uh, critical for the overall long-term success. We can't just get somebody to graduation. We got to help that individual to achieve after graduation. And to that point, I would piggyback and sort of ask, you know, in many ways, there is something for everyone in the Student Success Act, except for higher ed. Um, it feels like the big missing component. Why is that? Why was higher ed left out? Do you have a sense of that? Um, and do you think there's a timeline for deeper investments in higher education? So one thing I want to point out, everybody in here, everybody in here probably has got a four-year degree, I suppose. Don't know that, but I suppose that. The reality is many of our workforce needs are with high technical training. So when we say higher ed, I want to make sure that we encompass technical education. Look. Absolutely. I, I, I would be doing quite well as an electrician owning my own business in Eastern Oregon. Fact. We have not valued that type of pathway as much as this nation should. Uh, we need to get to that. So there's a balance to this in my mind. Absolutely. And something else I would add is that um, when the Joint Committee for Student Success, it's a bi bicameral, bipartisan committee was formed, they had a really clear charge and they were asked to focus on early learning through K-12. Um, but it doesn't mean that um, the conversation about higher ed stops right there. I've met with a couple of lawmakers over the last several months and they've talked about how higher ed plans to do their own road show with a very similar committee. I'm not sure what the timeline looks like, but that's an opportunity to really explore all of the different challenges that higher ed is experiencing, including um, the tech and voc ed pieces and the technical training. Um, what are those barriers to access? What are some of the financial pieces that need to be addressed? What are the supports that need to be addressed? And so I know that's going to be a part of a broader conversation statewide as well. So just know that this is not the end in itself. It continues and we're going to need folks with all hands on deck to help us support and and do this work so we get it right for our kids. I also want to add one piece as well that um, there is an opportunity 
decide to work most closely with higher ed and open up access for our early care and education workforce. So we have about a third of our educators who work with young children who have bachelor's degrees in this state. Something that our own data tells us is that um, the, our workforce is incredibly linguistically and racially diverse, but among those that have bachelor's degree and attain post-secondary degrees, it is no longer linguistically and racially diverse. And so with some of these new investments, we are gonna be able to open up access to um, community colleges and four-year institutions um, for early childhood educators. Excellent, thank you. And I think sort of with that theme, tapping on the more work to do, we are out of time for today and need to pause the conversation. We are grateful to everyone who made today's forum possible. Thank you to our speakers, Miriam Calderon, Parasa Chanrame, and Mark Witte. Thank you to Daniela Pacifico-Koken for producing this program. And thank you all for joining us. We are adjourned. <laughs>